Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. We appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us. Before we get started, I just want to cover a few housekeeping items. This webinar is produced by the Child Parent Institute, Greater Bay Area Child Abuse Prevention Council Coalition, and the Child Abuse Training and Technical Assistance Center, a project of the Center for Innovation and Resources. For those of you who can hear me, this might seem obvious, but I just want to remind everyone to turn on their speakers in order to hear the presentation. You can use the Q&A feature to ask the presenter any questions that you may have. We will leave time at the end of the presentation for Charlie to answer questions. The chat panel is where you can ask tech support questions. We will answer those immediately in this panel. I also just wanted to let everyone know that the PowerPoint presentation, along with a handout, will be available after the presentation. I'd like to welcome our presenter, Charlie Appelstein. Youth Care Specialist Charlie Appelstein, MSW, President of Appelstein Training Resources, provides expert strength-based training, consultation, publications, CDs, and DVDs for individuals and groups who work with children and youth experiencing emotional and behavioral challenges. Described as the best youth care trainer in America by Robert Lieberman, former president of the American Association of Children's Residential Centers, Charlie has devoted his entire adult career to helping children and youth struggling with emotional and behavioral challenges and those who guide them. An engaging, informative, and humorous speaker, Charlie is the author of three critically acclaimed books on youth care and the creator of two innovative CDs that help kids and parents make better choices and lead happier lives. Charlie's strength-based approach delivers a message of hope and possibility to our most vulnerable youth and those who share and influence their lives. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and let Charlie take the lead. All right, okay. How's everybody doing? I know. Well, I'm Charlie Appelstein. It's a great pleasure to be here. Can everybody hear me? I hope you can. So I got to tell you right away, I'm actually guilty about this book, No Such Thing as a Bad Kid, Understanding and Responding to Kids with Emotional Behavior Challenges Using a Positive Strength-Based Approach. I got to tell you, I'm pretty guilty about this book because I wrote it before I became a parent. My next book is There's Only One Bad Kid, Mine, um, only kidding, really good kid. Although she told me a few years ago, dad, you don't know how to talk to normal kids, maybe the trouble ones. I says, Julie, we'll be having a lot of talks over the next few years. I had a big one last winter when I accidentally erased Grey's Anatomy from the Comcast page. I didn't know she was watching it remotely from Washington DC where she's in college. Oh, did we have a big one. Uh, only kidding, great kid. So it is a great pleasure to be here today. Um, I titled today's training, let me put it up, share screen, here we go, oh yeah, uh, let me see my face here, uh, positivity in times of stress, understanding and responding to at-risk kids and families using a positive trauma-informed strength-based approach. Now I'm going to stop this year. Let me uh, give you a little history before I get going. In the late 70s, I started working in residential treatment centers with kids who had suffered terrible abuse in their lives. Uh, sexual, physical, emotional abuse, or some combination of the three. Those kids came into our residential centers angry, short fuses, acting out, pushing adults away because they didn't want to get close to us. No trust whatsoever. So they forced us, people like me who really cared about kids, didn't know a lot about kids at the time, they forced us to really come up with strategies and techniques that would meet these kids where they're at and would move them forward. Because with those kids, if you yelled at them, they blew. If you didn't say please and thank you to them when you make a request, which is my number one feedback, by the way, look at the difference. Could you please see me in the hallway? Thanks, see me in the hallway, like night and day. If you didn't say please and thank you to these kids when you made a request, they blew. If you didn't have routines and structure during the pandemic, what is so critical? Routines and predictability. So kids know what's happening next. If you don't have activities, that they could all be successful at. So they had more successes every day, which built this self-esteem and put chemicals in their brain. They blew. These kids forced us to create environments and use techniques that help them be all that they can be. 
and the techniques we came up with worked. They were very successful. And then 20 years after I started working, I found out that the techniques that I and my colleagues had developed or copied, uh, they actually fit under an umbrella. They're, they actually have a name. They're called using a strength-based approach, a strength-based trauma-informed approach. And uh, now my work for the last 20 years has been training people like you on these strength-based practices because they work and they really change the lives of our, of our most difficult kids. And they're backed up. Everything I'm gonna give you today is backed up by some of the most cutting edge research in neuroscience. And I'm gonna share that science with you. So it's absolutely irrefutable that this is the way to deal with kids. Now, interestingly, with this pandemic, what's become clear to me and others is that almost every kid, every family member you deal with has suffered some kind of trauma, loss because of this. So as a result, what do your clients need? What do your family members need? What do we all need to be treated in a positive trauma-informed kind of way, positive strength-based way? All the techniques I learned and developed in the 70s and 80s for severely traumatized kids, we need to do them now. We need to do them now because our kids are more sensitive, uh, they're lacking trust, they're showing some of the same symptoms that these kids do. So what you're gonna be getting from me over the next hour and a half is kind of the best of strength-based. These trainings are always the hardest for me because they only have an hour and a half. I have so much material I love to share with you. The good news is there's a big thick handout that I sent to the California folks. Uh, I will also send this PowerPoint afterwards. So don't worry about writing things down today. I'm gonna send you volumes of material on how to use a strength-based trauma form approach. So what you're gonna get from me over the next hour and a half is kind of the best of strength-based. What is it and what are the techniques and strategies you should be using to help the client you're dealing with right now? And like I said, I don't think it's ever been more important to use these because they change lives and they're backed up by some of the most cutting edge research in neuroscience. I'm hoping this whole pandemic will wake people up to the fact that we gotta start treating kids and families in a better way. There are better practices, there are better techniques out there. You know, Joe Biden said, you know, this pandemic is taking the Band-Aid off a lot of our problems in our society. Uh, the racial inequality, the poverty, and he's right. And hopefully this pandemic, a positive side to, we will make structural changes in our society. Me as a kid guy, I'm hoping we make changes the way we deal with kids. Because I know that what I'm gonna teach you today is the way. Sure, there are variations, but it is the way. So that's my little uh, intro. Uh, let's get into the training. All right, now, I'm new to this webinar. If I screw up today, hey, what's a mistake? Opportunity to take. All right, so I'm gonna get my PowerPoint up there. So I showed you the title. Uh, today is talking about positivity in times of stress, understanding responding to at-risk kids and families using a positive trauma-informed uh, strength-based approach. Uh, here's a simple definition of strength-based practice that I've cobbled together over the years. All right, let me make sure I can click here. Strength-based practice an emerging approach to guiding kids and families, and in particular, those with emotional and behavior challenges that is exceptionally positive and inspiring. It focuses on strength building rather than flaw fixing, what kids do right versus what they do wrong. It begins with the belief that all young people, or parents any age really, have or can develop strengths and use past successes to curb problem behavior, enhance academic and social functioning. Uh, as I mentioned before, everything I'm giving you today is really truly backed up by the science. And here is some of that science. There's a guy named Sean Acker who wrote a great book, which I recommend you read called The Happiness Advantage. Acker studies positivity for a living. He does research, he reports on other research. Here's some of his findings that pretty much support the whole approach I'll be giving you today. Recent research shows that the broadening effect how positive emotions broaden the amount of possibilities we process, making us more thoughtful, creative, and open to ideas, is actually biological. Positive emotions flood our brains with dopamine and serotonin, chemicals that not only make us feel good, but dial up the learning centers of our brains to higher levels. Positive emotions help humans to organize new information, keep that information in the brain longer, and retrieve it faster later on. 
and they enable us to make and sustain more neural connections, which allows us to think more quickly and creatively, become more skilled to complex analysis and problem solving, and see and invent new ways of doing things. Is that not what you want your kids doing, your clients doing? Brain change. One thought and possible is now a well-known fact, one that is supported by some of the most rigorous and cunning as research in neuroscience. It's almost impossible now not to adopt a positive trauma-informed strength-based approach because there's, there's the evidence right there. You know, 25 years ago when I first started doing trainings, I'd go to big detention centers and they'd laugh at me, some of the staff. They'd say, you're too nice to the kids. You're gonna be tough on them. You're gonna be tough on them. Else they won't respect you. They won't learn from you. Baloney. I've taken over detention centers and we turned those kids around, turned those programs around by being positive, by using these approaches. That doesn't mean you don't hold kids accountable, but you do it with respect. I tell people, anytime you wanna set a limit with a kid, a parent wants to set a limit with a kid, the first thing they should think about is the sanctity of the relationship. Behavior will come and go, but it's relationships that will move these kids to a higher sphere. It's all about relationship. Uh, and now most attention centers are adopting this approach because it really does work. So I started out today by giving a little history, a definition of strength-based practice, which is all about being more positive with kids, research that shows why positivity literally enhances the brain, actually creates new neural pathways with kids. But to me, strength-based practice is really about two words, attitude and actions. It starts with the attitude you convey to every client, old or young, from the moment you meet that person and then forever, that says, I believe in you. I think you're one amazing person. You're gonna make it with me, you're gonna make it in life, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be part of your journey. Now let's get going. And why is that so important? Because to me, it is the most important thing that you could bestow on a client, particularly a challenging person. The sense that you believe in that person, can't wait to see them, and just know they're gonna be successful. Why is that so important? Because it really is the most important thing. There's so many reasons. Let's start with a very simple but profound reason. When you get excited, on the phone when you're talking to a parent remotely, when you're getting excited to see them remotely on a Zoom meeting, when you get excited to actually see them face to face and they know it, they know you get excited to see them, it makes them feel good. And when they feel good, aren't they more likely to behave better, use the skills, use the strategies? Who in life functions well when you don't feel good? Depressed people, they cocoon. Literally, their brain constricts. Alternatively, when you get excited to see people, when you use the right strategies that are positive and inspiring. When your face says, hey, I can't wait to see you, you literally release chemicals in the brain and they start functioning better. So part of the strength-based stuff I'm giving you today is totally neurological. And when you get kids feeling good, parents feeling good, because of the way you relate to them and the words you use, what's happening? You're building great relationships. And almost all the research now on discipline is saying the same thing. If you want kids to behave better in any kind of setting, build great relationships with them. It's all about that. Uh, I heard James Gabarino speak a few years ago. He's, uh, one second. He's one of the world's foremost experts on kids and violence. He got in front of a group of a thousand people in Las Vegas and said, we can now predict with almost 100% certainty whether a tough teenager with a history of aggression will commit another act of aggression when he or she enters the high school in the fall. If we can look into this kid's life at any moment while they're at the school and see this one factor, we don't worry about the kid. What do you think that is? You got a tough kid entering your local high school in September. He has a history of aggression. Three months later, you look into his life, you see this factor and you go, hey, we're all set, he's gonna be fine. What's that one thing? One adult. What Gabrino says, if a tough kid with a history of aggression can wake up every day knowing there's at least one adult at the school who thinks I'm terrific, the odds of that kid doing something serious go down about zero. Zero. I think I've worked with 10,000 kids over the last 25 years uh, in all my different capacities. Uh, I would like to believe every one of them woke up every day thinking Mr. Appelstein can't wait to see me. I have to be his favorite kid. Now, is that true? No, but I don't think any of them know it. You gotta ask yourself the same question. Does every client you work with wake up every day thinking this guy, this lady can't wait to see me? The answer is no, what do you do about it? If you're not getting along with a client, make amends. Tell them, hey, you know, I'm feeling bad about how we've been getting along lately. 
it's not me against you, boom, 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 boom. You know, I apologize. You know, I, I, I've had kids say to me, no one in my life has ever apologized to me. You know, so you're not getting along with someone. Hey, welcome to the human race. We get at odds with our clients, with the people we work with, our own family members. Step to the plate. Say, I don't like the way we're getting along right now. Because it's all about that relationship. It's not all about the skills. You know, I uh, joke with my friends who do ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis. Now, they have a lot to offer. Everybody does. But I'll ask an ABA person, why do kids act out? And they'll say, because they lack skills. That's a crock. I've worked with thousands of kids over the years, observed thousands of others who seem literally out of control. A charismatic, caring, inspirational adult enters their life. Within minutes, they're behaving well. I've seen it. I've experienced it. Those kids had the skills. They didn't choose to use them. Now, I'm not getting in front of you people and saying it's not right to teach kids skills. Of course, they should learn that. Self-regulation, all that kind of stuff. Um, but let's not forget the importance of one person who can make a difference. You know? uh, why else is it so important to be so positive and inspiring with kids? Well, is it not true that every client you deal with, old or young, struggles with self-doubt, especially during a time of crisis like now? When your defenses are low, you really often question, am I any good? Am I doing anything? I question whether I'm a good trainer. I haven't done a training in two months. I, I, wonder, I wonder if I can do this, you know? Well, Degas, the great artist, said self-doubt kills ability. Self-doubt kills ability. If you're a strength-based person, and I'm sure most of you are, uh, what does that mean? It means you believe in every client, every kid, every adult. And you know that every one of your clients is gonna struggle with self-doubt from time to time, especially some of the more troubling ones. And you know self-doubt kills ability. So what do you do as a strength-based person? You know your clients are gonna struggle with self-doubt, so you come up with strategies that attack self-doubt. What are some of those strategies? One, get excited about little changes. In the strength-based world, we say little changes can ripple into big solutions. So you've got a family, a kid, whatever, they're struggling. They do a little bit better today. You should get so excited. Hey guys, I gotta tell you, I am so proud. Some of the decisions you made today, some of the actions, fantastic. Billy, when John jumped in front of you today, you didn't put, you didn't, I love that man, I love that. I'm giving you a slide, high five, do the thing. You know, you don't wait for the kids to go from, from here to here. You know, they make the littlest change. Wow, wow, that's fantastic. Little changes really do ripple into big solutions. Um, one of my favorite interventions I use with teachers and other professionals is the postcard. You know, I tell teachers, I tell professionals who work with kids, send postcards now and then when a kid has done something good, a kid who's been struggling. Uh, I wanna read you a little uh, quote. You know, this here, I'm gonna show you a postcard right now that I developed and stuff like that. I have teachers all over America. I tell them at the beginning of the year, go out to Vistaprint and buy postcards. And what I want you to do on the very first day of school, I want you to give every kid five postcards. And I want you to tell them that throughout the year, you're gonna be doing some amazing stuff for me. You're gonna blow me, and every now and then you're gonna blow me away. And during those times when you blow me away, I wanna send a postcard home to your mom or dad, tell them what you do, you know? So please write down on the postcard uh, your, your address, who you're living with, mom, dad, grandparents, whatever. Uh, as you can see, I got a stamp on it. I wanna be able to send this home and do something well. Think about a troubled kid, uh, a troubled student. Uh, when that mother or father sees caller ID and it's the local school, what is she thinking? Ah, oh, sheesh, what'd the kid do now? Oh, like I could do anything? You know, most of the parents of challenging students, they have PTSD, post-telephone stress disorder. They don't even wanna pick, pick up the phone. What do you do now? Teachers all the time say, I'm gonna call your mother if you keep this up. What is she gonna do? But let's say a tough family you're working with, let's say, you know, you can even get this now during the pandemic. Let's say the mother or dad of a really troubled student gets a postcard from a teacher next week. And it says, hey, dear Mrs. Gonzalez, I gotta tell you, Juan had the best session ever. He did more work in an hour than he's done all year. He's really turning the corner. I couldn't be more proud of him. 
And yesterday he actually wrote a creative story that blew me away. I, 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 I uh, texted it to some of my, it, it's incredible. He could be a writer. I just had to send you this postcard and tell you how proud I am and how proud you should be. He's making such strides. Think about a parent of a really challenging kid. She's gonna look at that postcard and think, oh, that can't be my kid. No, no, wait, that's his teacher, you know? And then she's gonna read it and then she's gonna cry. She's gonna cry. It's gonna be the first time in her life someone wrote something so beautiful to her about her kid. Now, all I'm saying is the kid just needed to do a little bit better for that postcard, just a little bit better for that kid to go home. And that postcard can literally change your life. I got a wonderful email from a teacher named Dawn in Massachusetts a few years back. She says, I thought about your idea for you for a few days to send postcards and decided who doesn't like mail that says something positive. So I ordered postcards I designed from Vistaprint, bought stamps and started writing. I have to say that the feedback I received has been fantastic. Parents have been emailing me, kids are coming up to me beaming, and thank you cards are being sent. One student who had been struggling now comes in early every morning to catch up on his work. Literally one postcard, one kind word, can literally change a kid's life. You know, you're a social worker, you're working with families, you're a caseworker. A uh, couple things here, you can send postcards. You send a postcard, where's it gonna go? On the refrigerator. These postcards, they go on the refrigerators. And now every time someone walks by the refrigerator, dopamine, serotonin gets off. If we get back to the schools, or you could even do this now, send postcards to the teachers of these kids who are doing remote learning and say, hey, I got a couple of challenging students here. And you send the kid a postcard when he's done some nice stuff. That can literally change a life. Little changes can ripple into dramatic solutions. Uh, now, I, wanna, I don't want to talk the whole time today, but you're going to get sick of me, and uh, I'm probably going to lose my voice. So at this point, I want to show you a really powerful video. Um, and then I want to ask you, I'm going to invite comments. Let's see if that works. I haven't done it before. I want you just to maybe sh shoot a few comments about why I'm showing it, and how this video could help you in your work with kids. So here we go. I'm gonna cross my fingers that this works. First time ever I've shown a video from a PowerPoint clip. Here we go.
Powerful, huh? I've seen it 20,000 times. I still choke up every time. Why did I show that to you today? I'd like to see if you could uh, 
maybe send in a comment or respond to that question. I think you have to do the question and answer. Why was it important for me to show you that video and what, how could that video help you in your work? What ideas could that spawn to help you with your clients? Because there's some really wonderful things in there. So let's see if, this is the first time I've done that. Let's see if I can see some of the responses you have to this video. Why it was important to show and what can we learn from watching that as professionals and as parents? What ideas could that spawn to make you be a better professional? It certainly gave me a lot of ideas. I'll just take a minute or so. Let's see here. Oh, wow. Oh my God, you made me cry. I was choking up too. I didn't know in a little video if you could see that. I was looking for tissue. I realized good that the teacher, someone wrote, the teacher made a mistake. Yes, yeah, she did. You should never do that. And she admitted that mistake. Simple, kind words. Uh, it makes others think how we could be more positive. Yes, yes. You know, one positive postcard, one positive letter can literally change a kid's life. You know what that piece of paper was with all the positive things on it? That's what we call a transitional object. Something a kid looks at, an adult looks at, and it reminds them of the love that they had in their life, the relationships, maybe the accomplishments. A lot of kids we work with and parents don't have those kind of trans transitional objects, something they can look at. So what is the implication for you? Maybe uh, you're working with a family, have the mother reach out to all her family members and friends and say, could you put the name of my kid on the top of a piece of paper and just write down one really good thing about each kid, their best quality. Then have the mother do the exact same thing and give it to the kids. Uh, something like that. You know, I have schools and places, they have chat boards where you put a positive note out. Uh, get the teachers you're working with to send postcards. The written word is so unbelievably powerful, as you saw in this kind of thing. So there's just one little thing I'd like you to add to your repertoire and understand how life-changing it can be. One piece of paper stays with a kid their whole life. We should be doing much more of that. Everybody wants to talk about consequences and negativity when kids act up. You know, I always think, how can we be more positive? You know, I might say this five times today, the biggest crock in the world is that kids like acting out. There could be no more stupid comment in the history of mankind. I've had school teachers say, oh, he likes being sent to the office. He gets to avoid the work, secretary's nice to him, lets him go in the candy jar. I've had people working with teenagers. Oh, he likes bullying, likes being rude, likes being provocative, likes doing drugs, likes cutting herself. No, they don't. No, they don't. If you could put Trusum into any troubled person, kid or older person, and say, who would you rather be? You the person who's acting out, or that person over there who has lots of friends, a wonderful family life, and a great future ahead of her. Who would you rather be? No kid would ever pick themselves. Behavior is always a message, a neon light flashing above a person's, help me out here, help me out here. And what's lacking for a lot of our clients is the positivity, the relationships, all the stuff I'm giving you today. And when you give them that, you literally transform lives. Okay, I gotta get back to my PowerPoint. Uh, all right, let's see here. Are we right here? Oh, this is good. I'm kind of slide. Uh oh, 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 geez, what happened? Uh oh. Ah, I had it. Okay, sorry. Let me share. I put it up. Okay, oh no, what happened? All right, I'm going to share screen. Something happened. Oh, okay. Here, it's not coming up. Oh, here we go. Okay, all right. Phew. All right. You know, I am a little bit of a technophobe. Okay. All right. What else do we do to attack self-doubt? Here's something a little bit controversial. Sometimes, under extreme duress, and other times, it's not a bad idea to use an incentive to get a kid or a family or a group to move a couple of baby steps. What do we say? Little changes ripple into dramatic solutions. Sometimes a kid is really stuck. Oftentimes under great stress, like this pandemic. There are kids out there who won't do any schoolwork right now. They're stuck. A lot of it is trauma related. I don't think it's such a bad idea to use incentives now and then to get a kid to move a little bit. If you have a PhD, 
you poo poo using incentives, which we would call extrinsic motivation versus intrinsic. In fact, a guy named Pink, I think it's Daniel Pink, wrote the definitive book a few years ago called Drive on why you shouldn't use incentives with kids. And I quote him in my new revised book, No Such Thing as a Bad Kid. Early on, I quote Pink, he says, incentives are like coffee. They produce a short-term boost and then they wear off. What good is that? That's all I'm looking for. When you have clients who are really stuck, often because of an external circumstance like trauma, oftentimes an incentive will get them to move a couple of baby steps. And when they move a few baby steps, they feel good. They like the success and they keep going. I've had thousands of kids over the last 40 years say to me, hey, Mr. A or Charlie, I don't need the incentive plan anymore. I'm feeling good now. Right. Oftentimes it's a means to an end. Probably the toughest kid I was ever referred. I, I was, I've been a behavior consultant in the schools for about 20 years. Uh, I get referred kids who are really acting out. Uh, the toughest kid I've ever been referred, I think, was a fifth grader. He uh, spent his entire fourth grade in a special ed school because he refused to do any work and he had serious mental health concerns. So they spend $100,000 for him to go to a residential school. He does no work there the whole year, but his behavior, his, his mental health issues improve a little bit, mainly due to medication. At the end of fourth grade, they had a big meeting and said, look, if he's not gonna do any work and his behavior is a little more under control, let's bring him back to his local elementary school. He can do fifth grade there. If he's not gonna do any work, we'll save money. He can do no work at his new school. We'll get an aid for 15,000, she can follow him around. That's what they did. So in November of fifth grade, they called me about the kid. I had never heard about him. Told me the whole story. Said, give it a try, go over there. So I drove over that day to meet him for the first time and I found him in the library. Very thin, gaunt kid, long stringy hair, very glassy eyes. He was on, I think, six medications. And he just wandered the school like a zombie all day long, followed by his aide. Well, that very first day, I found him in the library. He wasn't reading, he's just wandering. I said, or I approached him, I said, I'm Charlie Appelstein, the kids call me Mr. A. I'm gonna be working with you this year. He says, I'm Josh, my teacher has a knife, she's gonna slit my throat this afternoon. I said, well, Josh, what's your favorite restaurant? He said, I like McDonald's. She also has a gun, might blow my brains out. I said, well, Josh, what do you like at McDonald's? He says, Big Mac shake and fries. I said, well, how do you like that? We're in a library. Go find me any book, read me one sentence, and I'll stop everything and drive seven miles to the local McDonald's on Needham Street. Well, he looked at me kind of suspiciously, but he slowly walked over to a bookshelf, bent down, picked out a second grade book. Now, this is a kid who hadn't picked up a book in two or three years. He picks out a book, opens it up, and then with his fingers shaking, he reads a chapter, he reads one sentence, Took him about five minutes. I stopped everything. I drove to the McDonald's and I got him a big shack, big Mac shake and fries. By the end of the year, he was singing in the choir. He was off all medications, had lots of friends, and was a happy kid. Do you think that was a good investment? Nine bucks? You know, I could have saved that school district $99,911 if they'd hired me in fourth grade. He didn't need the incentives for very long. Once he started feeling good, making friends, connecting, and I could say that about thousands of other kids. Now, I'm not saying throw incentives at every one of your clients. What I'm saying is a good strength-based person should have a very big toolbox. The handout I'm going to send you, you could get 50 pages of tools. If someone says to me, a kid's doing this, what should I do? I don't know. There's so much context there. I don't know what's going on with a kid. But I have maybe 12 tools that we could try based on context. So you want to have a big toolbox and I wouldn't throw out incentives to get a kid to move a few steps. What are some of the ways we use incentives? Uh, I've had kids, or there are kids right now who won't do any reading or writing. I've had severely traumatized kids bust to big school districts who literally won't pick up a book. I use a road to reading chart. These bricks might be two inches by four inches. Or no, one inch by two inch. If a kid who has not done any reading or writing just looks at a book, they get a brick in the road. Six bricks, they get extra computer time or time with me or something fun. Uh, I've literally had kids who hadn't picked up a book start reading and writing. Sometimes you can say, you know, 
25 bricks and you get to Los Angeles or something like that. So you can make it kind of fun. You can make it a wavy road. But the road to reading has helped a lot of kids over the years. I, again, I do not use incentives with every kid. It's a tool in my toolbox because I know all great kids sometimes get stuck, are riddled with self-doubt, often by, because of the trauma. And sometimes you need that little push to get them moving forward. I also have had great success with the Billy Dollar. You know, you could take any one of your kids, put their face, cut their, take a picture of them, cut it into an oval, and tape it to a dollar bill. So a kid earns Carlos dollars, Juanita dollars, Billy dollars. I've had people say to me, kid never responded to anything until you put their face in a dollar bill. That's actually what they call the medium of exchange. What you, they get, what you exchange for them doing something nice. With older kids, I love the tickets. I tell kids, learning is your ticket to a good life. When you go for a job interview, they're not gonna give you a job because you're a good looking person with a nice sense of humor. You gotta bring your ticket with you and that's your education. So oftentimes with high school kids and older kids, if they start doing a little bit better academically, they get a ticket. And they can either trade those tickets in for something or what we sometimes do is if they get tickets, uh, you put them in a big jar and maybe once a week have a raffle. Again, I'm just trying to give you options here. I'm not saying use incentives with every kid. Uh, but I, I, if I had more time, I could tell you stories that, again, would make you cry because we used one incentive to get a kid who was stuck. Uh, because again, when a kid is stuck, what are they? They're being protective. What they're really saying is, I don't want to try. I don't want to do anything that makes me look more stupid. You know, so that's why we'll get to this later in the training, I hope, because I only have limited time. But I hate the term resistant. I don't think I've met a resistant kid in my 42 years in the business, no. To me, a resistant kid is a cautious kid. They would love to read and write. They would love to behave better. They would love to get the job. They would love to do this, this, and that. They're just cautious because they don't want to be hurt. They often traumatized kids and kids under stress. They've had enough hurt. They don't want to risk it, even though it would make them feel better. So I'll say to a kid, you know, you're pretty cautious if you don't try this, try this. You're also an amazing kid. How about give me one little baby step? Just give me one little baby step, that's all. And if you do, boom, boom, boom. What else do we do to attack self-doubt? Normalize mistakes, you know? Uh, oftentimes kids, particularly kids under stress, kids who've suffered trauma, they can't stand making a mistake because they take it personally. They say, I'm stupid, I can't do this. So many kids in America, they blow off things every day, won't try things because what if I fail? What if I screw up? You know, I'm working with a kid and uh, I'm playing cards with a kid or talking to the kid and I'll yell out, hey, what's a mistake? And the kid has to go, an opportunity to take. All right, I want you to yell out. I'm gonna do the first half. What's a mistake? Say it, an opportunity to take. You should like uh, start your next Zoom meeting with the family or whatever and say, hey guys, before we get going here, you know, I gotta tell you, I was doing, uh, filling out some forms the other day. I made a big mistake. Was I excited or what? What's a mistake? an opportunity to take. Hey guys, before we start the meeting, I wanna go around the room. Anybody make mistakes yesterday on your schoolwork or anything? I love that, I love that. What's a mistake? An opportunity to take. I can see in front of me thousands of kids I've worked with in the schools, treatment centers, foster care. They make a little mistake, they blow because it says what they're thinking is I'm stupid, I can't do this. You know, so they should hear this, be, you know, the best way to deal with problem behavior is to prevent the behavior. I don't really think I'm a behavior guy. I'm a preventing behavior guy. If we know kids act out because they have very low frustration tolerance and they can't stand making mistakes, so let's normalize it, you know? I tell kids, everybody makes mistakes, just keep trying. The big thing in working with kids nowadays is the growth versus the fixed mindset, i.e. kids need to learn that it's okay to screw up. Just get up and try again. That's all about effort. It's not about being so smart all the time. It's about effort. I get in front of whole kids, whole groups of kids now. You know, I love it. I go, if I'm an eagle on the ground and I do this, I do this. Do I get very high? No, but what if I do this? I get really high. The harder I try, the higher I fly. The harder I try, let me hear you. The higher I fly. The harder I try, the higher I fly. Be the eagle. Be the eagle. You know, I love this. You know, like I said, you're in a family meeting or you're working with a kid, you're driving the kid somewhere, if you ever could do that again. Out of the blue, go, the harder I try, and they have to go, the higher I fly. How do I try? Higher I fly. Be the eagle. 
Be the eagle. I love this kind of self-talk, this rhythmic self-talk. It is amazing, and it gets right into the brain, right into the brain. All you have to do is just start it. The higher I, the higher I fly. I had a mother email me, said my kid was really struggling taking piano, didn't like to practice. I put a picture of an eagle on the, on the piano bench with your saying, the harder I, she's been playing, practicing every day now. I love this stuff. And let's face it, a lot of kids have had tough lives under trauma, and that's been all the kids now. They hate losing. When you're feeling stressed and your self-esteem is fragile, you hate losing. And sometimes you overreact to it. So I say to kids, if you lose, don't get the blues. If you lose, don't get the blues. And if you don't, oh, oh sorry. Ooh. Yeah, okay, here we go, sorry. And if you don't win, just grin. If you don't win, just, hey guys, I was at the, I was, I, I was playing online, I was playing chess online last night. I made a stupid move and I lost, you know. I started getting mad that I kept thinking, if you lose, don't get the blues. And if you don't win, just grin. I love this stuff. You don't say these lines to a kid or a family or anybody when it's happening. This is what we call pre-correction. A behaviorist will tell you if you warn a kid about a behavior when it's happening, it's too late. No, you do it beforehand. Again, my thing is I'm a preventative behavior guy. You know? um, and as I mentioned before, what a lot of this stuff has to do with is a lady named Carol Dweck. Carol Dweck wrote a really good book years ago called Mindset. And basically what she says is the view you adopt for yourself affects the way you lead your life. If a kid thinks they're a loser, if they think they're stupid, if they think this, they have a negative self-perception, it affects everything they do. And a lot of kids develop these negative self-perceptions because they make mistakes, because they screw up. So all this material I'm giving you right now attacks that. Dweck came up with um, nice terminology, the fix versus the growth mindset. She warns parents, don't call your kids smart so much because then they develop a fixed mindset. I'm a smart kid, I'm a smart kid. And then when they get to school and they screw up, they melt down, wait a second, I'm smart. I should get this. So she says, no. Focus more on effort. Let kids know it's okay to screw up. Getting things wrong, making mistakes are opportunities to learn something new, like we talked about. I would also, I hope I'll get to this today, but again, I have limited time. That's why you also don't want to use words like rude, manipulative, lazy, looking for attention, manipulative. Don't let the parents use those words with the kids unless they put the word choose in front of it. Because if a kid hears a negative adjective one too many times, rude, uh, obnoxious, lazy, they literally take it on and they stop trying. You can put the word choose in front of it and sometimes use the word, you know, when you do this, this, and this, you're choosing to manipulate me and, you know, but that, maybe that's your way of getting control. Or a kid who's resistant. You know, like I said, I don't use that word. I said, you know, when you refuse to do work and stuff like that, you know, you're really being cautious. You know, you're really being cautious and who can blame you? Maybe you've had enough disappointment in your life. But I would never call a kid resistant ever. You know, when you're doing this and this, you're choosing to be resistant. But I think it's your way of being cautious. And that's, that probably has kept you safe. Kept you safe. I'm a real word guy. You got to be really careful about the words you use. It's all about mindset. So many people don't make it in life because they have these negative adjectives. And because they think if they lose, they're bad. Or, uh, you know, they always have to get things right. No, this stuff addresses all that. This kind of stuff should be hanging in every home, every school in America. Thomas Edison's teacher says he was too stupid to learn anything. He was fired from his first two jobs for being non-productive. As an inventor, Edison made 1,000 unsuccessful attempts at inventing the light bulb. When a porter asked how to fail 1,000 times, Edison replied, I didn't fail 1,000 times. A light bulb was an invention with 1,000 steps. Bingo, he had a growth mindset. Yeah, let me see down here. If he had had a growth mindset, a fixed mindset, I can't do this, let him use candles. Michael Jordan's getting a lot of play lately with the uh, Last Dance video on ESPN. Michael Jordan said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over again in my life. That's why I succeed. Every kid in America should see this on every refrigerator. It should be a state law that refrigerators have to put this so kids see this every day. If we change their mindset, we change their lives. And that's what a great worker does, is you're changing their mindset. I don't fuss so much about limit setting and all that kind of stuff, because I'm so convinced that if you do all the other stuff we're talking about today, all of it and more, the kids don't want to act out anymore. Because what's bringing your kids down, it's not their talent. 
It's not even that they lack skills. Some of them do lack skills, but a lot of them, it's their mindset. You know, it's the way they think about themselves, you know? So let's, one of our big goals when we work with kids and adults is change their thinking. If it's stinking, change the thinking. If it's stinking, change the thinking. That should be on every refrigerator. You know, when I want to go act it out, right? My, when I want to act out myself, I'm getting mad right now at my kid or something like that. Or I want to send a bad email to somebody. I think that's stinking thinking. That's stinking thinking, you know. Uh, the other thing that goes with stinking thinking is wants and needs. One of the greatest self-management strategies you can use, I can use, kids could use is wants and needs. You know, you want to talk to kids, you know, and parents about the fact that anytime you're upset, you should be thinking, what do I want to do right now? But what do I need to do? I tell kids, when I go into Dunkin' Donuts, what do I want? Chocolate covered coffee roll. What do I need? Veggie egg white. What do I want? Chocolate covered coffee roll. What do I need? So what do I want to do right now? I want to punch my brother. What do I need to do? Let it go, Joe. Let it go, Joe. What do I want to do? Blow off my homework. What do I need to do? Take it one step at a time, little by little. Just get a little bit done. So that, because wants and needs speaks to the stinking thinking that so many kids have, you know? And to digress a little bit, what I've been doing over the last five, 10 minutes is really showing you the value of rhyming, of using lines to literally change a kid's life. And I've been actually doing that for the last 15 years, and it's been amazing. I came up with this technique called one line raps. It's where you give a kid a line or a group of line or anybody, a parent, and they say it over and over again. It gets into long term memory and they start using it for behavior gain. I did a, uh, uh, a training in Boston many years ago. Uh, Boston, a mother emailed me about six weeks later. She says, Charlie, is that your training? Now, this lady happened to run a mentor program in Washington, D.C. And she says, I was at your training, Charlie, in Boston six weeks ago. And I have to tell you, I was very depressed that day. I have a 16-year-old daughter who's been hospitalized for a number of months. She has oppositional defiant. It's awful. And every time we talk on the phone, we fight. It's terrible. Uh, I felt like I was missing her whole adolescence. It was terrible. A couple of weeks after your training, I was on the phone to her, and we were arguing like we always argue. And in the middle of the conversation, uh, I, in the middle of the conversation, I said, what the hell? Why not try something different? So I looked at her and I yelled, Julia. No, I looked, I yelled to the phone. I said, Julia. And she says, what? She says, repeat after me. She goes, what? Just repeat after me. So say this right now, folks. Stop and think. Don't be a dink. Stop and think. Don't be a dink. Come on, say it out there. Stop and think. Don't be a dink. She said at the end of the phone call, they were both laughing so hard that the final words from the kid to the mother is, mom, I haven't felt this good in three years. Three years. That one line changed her whole life. She had a dramatic turnaround. They moved up her discharge date. And then right before the discharge date, she starts freaking out over the discharge plans. So they came up with uh, stop and listen, cause you don't know what you're missing. Stop and listen because you don't know what you're missing. And it, it helped. I mean, I could tell you a million more stories. Why does this work? Go back to the, uh, this page, right near the top. Bruce Perry, one of the number one trauma guys in the world, once wrote, the brain is designed to change in response to pattern repetitive stimulation. If you get a line in your head and you hear it over and over again, you can't get it out. Why does this work? Seven times seven is what? 49. Why do you know that? It's not very interesting, you know, because someone drilled it in your head. You know, you'll be on your deathbed. You'll be 97, you'll be incontinent. You'll be in some flea bag hospice gasp, gasping for breath. You'll hear a little grandkid on the waiting room doing her homework, seven times seven. Why not? Why not? And then you'll die. <laughs> you can't get it out of your head. There's no such thing as a sevenectomy. So my thing is, if you can't get seven times seven out of your head, why aren't we giving kids with ADD step after step? That's the prep. Little by little, play the fiddle. No need to groan, I can start on my own. Don't call out, share the air. Inch by inch, life's a cinch. Don't move all over the place. Sit and learn with a happy face. Anger, let it go, Joe. Let it go, Joe. Just stay cool, no need to blow. 
I can't, I will, I gotta chill. And if I do, it's quite a thrill. If you get mad, don't do bad. Just talk or walk, talk or walk. I got a lot of these in the handout. If you go to my website, charlieA.com, I have tons of these. If you ever need one, email me. I'll stop everything and do it. I, uh, one last thing about this, because we got to move on. I got, I got so much stuff I could share with you. Um, I was doing a weekly parenting segment on a big cable channel in Boston years ago. Uh, I did a segment on this stuff. And a week later, I walk in, and the weatherman, big figure throughout the East Coast, he's still on, actually. He came up to me, and he shook my hand. He says, thank you, Charlie, thank you. I go, what? He says, I can't tell you all the specifics, but as I was driving home after the show last week, I kept saying to myself, if you talk in an angry tone, you'll live alone. If you talk in an angry tone, you'll live alone. He said, I had the best week of my family I've had in three years. Three years, one line. He just sent me a thank you, I know a congratulation note on LinkedIn. This was in my work anniversary. It was 12 years since I was on that show. He said, I'm still doing better because of that line, because of my shift in thinking. It's incredible, it's incredible. Uh, now, let's get back to self-doubt kills ability. We've been talking about kids have self-doubt and a strength-based person knows great kids have self-doubt and I've given you strategies to attack it and a little bit more. What else is in there when it comes to self-doubt? Trauma. When kids have suffered trauma, um, they often retreat. They don't wanna try anything because what if I fail? What if I'm hurt? Um, I think a really good way to understand trauma is, uh, uh, and a guy named Larry Brentro, sorry about that. A guy named Larry Brentro actually wrote a great article years back, he and another guy named Broadhurst about trauma. And they said something very interesting. They said, the, the human brain is like a library. Uh, Kids remember everything that happened to them. It affects everything they do. And what he's saying is kids have suffered trauma. They remember it all, and it affects everything they do. So oftentimes kids have suffered trauma. They don't want to be hurt anymore. So they won't try anything. They won't sign up for a job. They won't take a music class. They won't get extra help. They won't do this. They won't do that because what if I fail? What if, I'm, what, what if, I, what if I look stupid? Every day in America, people who have suffered trauma blow things off because what if, what if? You know, uh, so when I heard uh, that metaphor that the human brain is like a library, I immediately envisioned kids who suffered trauma as having wings of shame, wings of pain, wings of humiliation in the lower part of their brain, which Brentrell calls a survival brain, which is all about self-protection and is overutilized for kids who suffer trauma. Literally, the kids you work with who suffer trauma, the parents, they literally have wings of shame, wings of pain, wings of humiliation in the lower part of their brain and they're bursting with books. That's why when you ask one of these kids to sign up for something, do this, do that, oftentimes you know, that's stupid, I don't wanna do it. They'd rather play the video games because what they're saying is I can't put another book in the wing of pain. I can't fit another edition into the wing of shame. I've had enough to last me a lifetime. You know? Children traumatized by neglect and abuse overuse their more primitive brain systems. Their survival brains uh, are chronically stimulated, which is the lower part, the more defensive part of the brain, and are at high risk of engaging in behaviors that hurt themselves, the others. You hear the terms fear, fight, and flight, uh, hypervigilance. These are the kind of kids where they're walking down a hallway and a kid gives them a look, they do. They're the kind of kid, they're doing okay, they get a bad text mes message from, from a boyfriend, they blow. Because they can't really process it. They are wired to react. It makes perfect sense. When you suffer trauma, you're wired to react. You use that lower part of the brain. You don't use the upper parts of your brain. Uh, and that stops you from moving forward because it's the upper parts of the brain that are all about critical thinking, problem solving, delayed gratification, perspective. The trauma people don't do that the way they should because of the way they're wired. I think a good way to understand trauma is to go to Africa. I went on safari many years ago. Anybody know what elephants do when they suffer, da suffer uh, when they experience danger? I saw this multiple times. We could approach a herd of elephants spread over acres of land. As soon as they sense danger, uh, they always do this. Well, actually, before I, uh, I get to that, let me just show you uh, what Brentro wrote about kids who suffered trauma, adults who suffered trauma, and tell me if this does not resonate with you in terms of the clients you're dealing with. Many of these youngsters who have suffered trauma have not had the nurturance and learning experiences to fully develop brain pathways to self-control. 
Thus, their heightened impulsivity, frustration, and motor hyperactivity, combined with an undeveloped capacity to accurately perceive situations and problem solve. This unfortunate combination severely limits the child's ability to maximize his or her potential. Does that not describe many of the kids you're working with? As I mentioned, a good way to understand trauma is to go to Africa. What do elephants do when they sense danger? They could be spread over acres of land, but as soon as they sense danger, they do this. They get into this tight circle. The moms and dads man the perimeter, and the little children in the middle. And those elephants will die in that circle, protecting the young. These elephants here, they won't tack, take the path behind them to get to the water hole they need for hydration. They won't find the path to the right that will take them to a more lush region of the jungle where there's a better food supply. No, they're gonna die in that circle protecting the young. See this as the human brain. The bottom part is the survival brain, which is overutilized for any adult, any kid who suffered trauma. Kids who suffered trauma and adults are not, oops, are not using the upper parts of the brain, which Brentrell calls the logical brain, the emotional brain, which is all about critical thinking, problem solving, delayed gratification. No, they're still down there. If you can see those pathways right behind the elephants, right behind them and to the right, see those pathways as neural connections. What's supposed to happen in proper human development that happened with you and I? As we mature in good enough, safe, loving environments, we start to access these neural pathways. We create new ones to use and venture to the upper parts of the brain that help us live better lives. And then those pathways, they kind of intersect and that kind of synergy leads to high functioning individuals. Sadly, the kids who suffered trauma, the adults, they didn't create those pathways, didn't use those pathways. So you get the fear of fight and flight. Prison is full of people who are abused. And they never developed the upper parts of the brain, so they tend to react, they tend to react. That's the really bad news and that's why people like you and me are too busy. We have just too much trauma in this world and it's exacerbated by current circumstances. That's the really bad news. Here's the good news. As we continued on safari, every now and then we come across a herd of elephants that would not get into the circle when they saw us. They'd see us humans, but continue to venture into the higher regions of the jungle. Use existing pathways, create new pathways. Why is that? You know, because they weren't afraid of us. In fact, they were kind of excited to see us. Hey guys, humans are back. Hey, Dumbo, you can get your back, backwash, brother. Guys, humans. Literally, everything I'm telling you today is about the circle, whether you're dealing with traumatized kids or not. You want to create relationships, environments. You want to use verbal interventions. You want to use strategies. All the things I've been giving you and more so that these kids will start to use the upper parts of the brain. They won't be afraid. You know, this is why treatment centers, schools, homes that use a positive strength-based approach they have dramatic results with kids and the kids don't regress when they go to their next setting because what's happening when you have a positive strength-based culture, a trauma-informed culture, kids develop upper parts of their brain. It's a permanent thing and they can manage forever. That's why people like me and I, you and me are so busy. Uh, Brentrow writes, neuroplasticity refers to the reality that the brain is malleable and can therefore change thoughts existence. Now here's my favorite sentence in the world. Positive and frequently occurring experiences can create new neural pathways that enhance functioning and produce growth. Bingo, there's the line that defines, explains the whole strength-based approach. Positive and frequently occurring experience can create new neural pathways that enhance functioning and produce growth. When you do all the stuff I'm talking about, please and thank you. Greeting with a big smile, uh, reframing negative behavior, uh, Maybe using incentives, uh, normalizing mistakes, uh, helping with winning and losing, all of this kind of stuff, helping instill a growth mindset. When you do all the stuff in such a positive, effusive way, literally the kids start developing parts of the brain and they don't go back. Now, I think the number one reason, despite the power of everything I have mentioned, for why it's so important to be so strength based with kids, it attacks self doubt, helps build great relationship. I gotta believe the number one reason for being so positive and inspiring with your clients is that when you are, it leads to the four letter H word, you can't live life without. And what's that word? Hope. Hope is humanity's fuel. You could have a Mercedes Benz out in the parking lot. It's going nowhere if it doesn't have fuel. Strength-based practices, every client you work with, every kid you work with is a Mercedes Benz. But by the time they get to you, they're on empty, they're on fumes. These are not broken down dysfunctional kids that need to be fixed or adults. No, these are all great people 
who's empty, whose gauges aren't. Your job is to put the fuel in. Think about when kids go to bed at night, when you go to bed at night, we start a Rolodex. We think about all the positive things that are gonna come in our lives, the goals we have, the future. And we wake up refreshed. Sadly, kids and adults who have suffered trauma, who've had tough lives, they go to bed. They can't even get to bed, some of them. And when they do, they toss and turn because nothing good comes up. Uh, it is what strength-based practice is all about. It, it's actually kind of simple. Strength-based practice is all about you and me getting into the Rolodex. So when a tough kid goes to bed at night uh, and the Rolodex starts, all of a sudden he's thinking about you, his new worker. Hey, I got Mary now. I love her. And I beat her in Connect Four yesterday. You know, she got so mad. Uh, she sent my mother a nice postcard. She talks about my future. Uh, you know, she normalizes mistakes. You know, she gave me a little incentive for doing a little schoolwork yesterday. Uh, I love this lady. Get so excited to see me. I love this lady. That's 30 gallons of fuel in the tank. That's someone getting into that kid's Rolodex and increasing the odds that tomorrow will be better. You know, and by the way, strength based practice, strength based parenting, working with kids. Rookie with families, it's all about one word, probability. The better we do, the better they're gonna do. There's no guarantee in this business. At the end of every day, when I play my day over my head, the way a lot of us do, I never ever judge my success based on the behavior of the kids I was working with or the families. No, I ask myself one question every night. Did I behave well? Did I use the strength based stuff in a really good way? And if I, and if I screwed up, did I apologize? The answer is yes, I go to bed smiling. I know I increase the odds that tomorrow will be a better day. In my 42 years, I've hardly ever seen a kid or a family not do immeasurably better. It happens, but hardly ever if you maintain this positive strength-based approach. And as I mentioned with hope, it's critical to talk about the future. Kids who have suffered trauma, kids who are going through rough times right now, they're cocooning neurologically. They're overusing that lower part of the brain, which is that reactive and defensive part. It has never been more critical as a result to talk to kids about their future. But it is at all times. James Garbarino, one of the world's foremost experts on kids and violence, uh, he said recently that terminal thinking, the inability to articulate one future may be a clue to why some kids make it, some don't. I came up with a technique years ago called positive predicting. I'm gonna move past this one. Um, so I meet a kid for the first time or a family or a group, anybody, and I'll, you know, one of the first things I'll say is, uh, so how should we, again, I get referred really acting out kids or groups. How should we celebrate in six weeks when you've had six of the best weeks you ever had before? You know, what's the message? And then I argue with the kid about what he says because I want this kid walking away thinking, this guy really thinks I'm gonna turn the corner. I have a future. And when you talk to kids about the future, it literally opens up the brain, which we said they're not using. Here are some classic questions I might ask. How are we gonna celebrate when this week's at? when this ends, the pandemic, and we get back to our normal life. How are we gonna celebrate? You know, what's the first restaurant we go to when this is over? What are you gonna be when you grow up? Critical to talk to kids about the future. Uh, uh, tell me the top three colleges you'd like to attend. Uh, how should we celebrate when you boom, 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 when you do this, when you do this, when you do that? You always put the card before the horse. As it says here, when you talk about the future in truly positive terms, you make any desired outcome more possible. And when it becomes more possible, it becomes more probable. A guy named Rick Miller started a big group in Arizona called Kids at Hope. He said he's, Google them, they're amazing. He said that he studied for seven years what makes kids successful. This was his findings. Children succeed when they are surrounded by adults who believe they can succeed, no exceptions. Children succeed when they have meaningful, sustainable relationships with caring adults. Okay, we've been talking about that all day. Nothing new there. His third one got my attention. It said children succeed when they can articulate their future in four domains rather than one home and family hobbies and career community and service hobbies and recreation so what he recommends parents and professionals constantly ask the people you're dealing with those questions do you think you'll attend a trade school junior college or four-year school what professions are you leaning towards do you think you'll travel a lot when you're older again i'm not going to read them all but really if i'm a caseworker i'm a teacher i'm working with kids i'm in a residential center always asking about questions, doing assignments. Um, I've had a lot of funds. I have it in schools and treatment centers, I, 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 in any kind of setting. I have every kid create a business card. This is the first time I did it. I was working with a fourth grader who was very depressed, wasn't doing any work, but he was a great artist. So my wife and I, we created this business card for him. This was about 25 years ago. Thompson Associates, Master Art Design and Graphic, Kenneth Thompson, President. 
We made 30 of them. I brought him in the next day, gave it to him. He's walking around the school all day. Hey, use my studio in a few years. Use my art studio. Right out of his shell, he came. I got this email from a high school teacher a couple of years ago. Uh, all the high school kids created their own business cards and they put them on the wall, future leaders. You know, you know uh, what do you want kids looking at every day in any kind of setting, rules or my business card or future leaders of America, future leaders of California. It's amazing how this stuff affects people. Uh, you can also go to any college, get the diploma, put a kid's face in the corner and have somewhere college bound kids. Here's Sophia Rodriguez, college bound kid, future engineer at this science school. You want to talk, you know, you have a lot of time to talk to kids about life as you meet with them. One of your big things is to talk about the future. If I had more time today, I would tell you stories that make you cry about using positive predicting. It's absolutely critical. And again, hope is about the future. It's about believing in yourself, knowing you can make it. I love metaphors, particularly in this vein. My favorite is the train. I tell every kid, every family I work with, every kid, every family is like a train. Every group is a train, big, powerful train. But right now, you got a little off track. You know, who can, I, who can blame you, given what's going on? But you got a big engine there, brother. And we got to get you back on track soon. Back on track, Jack. Back on track, Jack. You know, it's powerful. I, uh, I still see kids, and uh, I walk through a school. I walk through a treatment center. I see a kid down the hallway. I go, hey, Bill, I heard about the quiz yesterday in science. <laughs> yeah, you're bringing that train back to the station, brother. You know, maybe I'll uh, put my little hat on. Hey, woo! <laughs> Nine out of 10, you the man, you know? Like I said, every kid is like a train, big, powerful train. If you're a caseworker, social worker, I don't know how you work without this kind of standard operating, operating procedure. You gotta have this stuff. What do you want these kids and families thinking about when they go to bed? Appelstein says, I'm like a train. I'm just a little off track, you know? You're working with a family. Mrs. Jones, boy, wheels are spinning, steam's coming out, oil's simple. We just gotta get you back on track, that's all. Back on track, jack, you know? Let me see what time we have here. Let me ask you a question now. I know I can't raise my hand to this question. Have any of you ever worked an entire day with your clients, your kids, ever spent an entire day with your own kids and not had a moment or two where you thought, what the heck do I say now? What the hell do I do now? Have any of you ever gone an entire shift, home or at work, without a what the heck moment? I never have. I'm with my 21-year-old uh, daughter, 12 seconds, and I'm thinking, what would a good parent do now? You know, Charlie, write books, you know this. How about the next time and every time thereafter for the rest of your career, you're in a difficult situation with a kid, a parent, a group, your own, and you're not sure what to say or do. You take a step back with the observing ego, that little voice that talks to you in your head and say, it doesn't matter what I say right now. It doesn't matter what I do. 20 years from now, this kid, this group, isn't gonna remember what I said to them on April 27th, 2020 at 11, 13 in the morning. But well, what do you hope to God every single kid remembers about you 20 years from now, 10 years from now, if they come back to visit? Not what you said any given, not what you said any given day, but how you made them feel. Hey, remember me, Charlie, from the program? God, that was the worst year of my life. But man, you never gave up on me. You never gave up on me. You know, I have kids coming back years later and they say those kind of things. You know, don't worry about the words you use and worry about your attitude. That's what they're going to remember. At the end of every day, when I play my day in my head, I never judge my success based on the kid's behavior. It's my behavior. You know, it's the attitude. Did I believe in every kid? Based on everything I told you today, um, which is backed up by some of the most cutting-edge research, which I read to you starting out, it's become abundantly clear to me that to be a successful child care professional or educator clearly means you have to be a great liar or a great actor. Does anybody out there think, your job with kids is to be honest with them, clients to be honest with them. You lie through your teeth all the time. You, you get to work tomorrow you're, and you find out that your most difficult kid, Billy, he's sick, not in a bad way, let's say, and he can't visit with you or he has an appointment, he can't visit with you. You can't stand the kid. Yes, yes, oh, thank you God, no Billy today, you know Billy today, mm -hmm. thank you God. 17 minutes later, you get a call from the mother. Hey, Billy's feeling better. He, he wants to chat with you. Ah, oh, for crying out loud. Are you kidding me? 
you know, all right, Billy, you know, provoke me, start out now, you, you know. No, not in a million years. Billy, brother, I was so upset when I couldn't see you today. Oh, man, catch me up. Oh, kill that mother, oh, kill that mother, you know. Now, I don't like the term lying. I like the term acting. When you work with at-risk kids, you got to be a great actor. You know, oh, by the way, Tom Brady, California boy. California boy. Biggest liar in the NFL. I have to say goodbye to Tom to go to Tampa Bay, but he clearly lied about the footballs. So what do I care as long as he gets me Super Bowls? No, I don't like the term lying. I like term acting. When you work with at-risk clients, you got to be a great actor. you got to emote this positivity whether you believe it or not, because that literally changes the brain of your clients. You know, it is absolutely critical. You know, and by the way, do you think there's a Grand Canyon schism between the most troubled kid in California? Any one of you? I don't think so. Say I walk, say any one of you is being wheeled in for open heart surgery tomorrow. During the pre-op period, the surgeon came in and said, excuse me, Mr. Brown, I'd like to be honest with you before I cut your heart open today. I'm kind of in a bad mood. I was working on a research paper last night. My computer froze. I didn't get a lot of sleep. Then this morning when I was driving in, my broker beat me. I lost 10 grand IBM. I told the sucker no tech stocks. So I'm pissed, I'm irritable, I'm tired, but I can cut your heart open, Mr. Brown. Are you gonna say cut, doctor? Or you may say, what a ridiculous analogy. Open heart surgery to what I do every day with my clients. You're right. It is a ridiculous analogy. Because what you do is so much more important than what the surgeon does. Your heart will be a piece of meat on a slab to this guy two weeks later. He ain't gonna remember you. That these kids will only be 14 years old, 10 years old, seven years old, on April 29th, 2020, one day in their life. And they're running out of time. And if you make the conscious decision to start an interaction, start a shift with anything less than, I can't wait to see you, you're amazing. You take away a little bit of the probability of that kid having a good day, good life. And that's what this job's about, it's about probability. Now let me ask you a question. This is a flip side to this positive stuff. As much as this positivity stuff can elevate kids to amazing levels, and it's all evidence-based, it's also true that if you're too negative, people are too negative with these kids, don't use the right kind of language, that can bring them down every bit as much as the positive stuff can bring them up. Here's an example of this. Let's say tomorrow you get a phone call from your boss and he says, you know how you have one opening on your caseload? Well, we just got two kids referred. Both are actually borderline for our setting, but I'm gonna take a shot with one of them and assign them to you. Let me give you a thumbnail sketch of both kids. You tell me which kid you wanna work with. We'll go with it, no questions asked. First is a 10-year-old girl with scars on her forearms, horribly abused by a step-parent many years ago. Um, she wears long sleeve sweatshirts all year long, doesn't want a soul to see the scars. He's been in prison, these are the pictures. She's a really hurting kid. Um, um, but the really good news is that after fighting it for many years, she's finally agreed to see a therapist. Uh, and for the first time in her life, she's letting out all the pain that she's been holding in from the terrible abuse that she suffered. She also wears multiple layers of clothing all year long. We're under strict orders that if you start working with her, you can't say anything about what she's wearing. Because like I said, the really good news is she's finally had a breakthrough and is gonna see a therapist. That's the first girl, real tough kid though, real tough kid. Second is another 10 year old girl that just got booted out of a foster home a couple counties over. Described by the former foster mother as the most passive aggressive obnoxious kid she's ever had. She's very big, she has horrible hygiene, um, obstinate, demanding, self-centered, mean. Uh, mother said she's the most ornery, difficult kid she's had in her 30 years of foster care, and that she has horrible hygiene and won't do a thing about it. She almost uses it like a weapon. The stench is unbelief. Uh, that's the second kid. You gotta tell me in total honesty, if you had to pick between those two girls, who would you pick? Now, most of you are gonna say the burned kid. I probably would too. Why? Oh, because I said the first kid, she has scars, but she was burned uh, by a step parent. So most of us are gonna pick that kid, the first kid. Why? Why do most people pick the burned kid? Because you feel bad. You have sympathy for the kid. Um, you like that she's finally seeing a therapist. You have great compassion and empathy because of what she endured, the poor kid. And again, you're feeling hopeful because she agreed to go into therapy. So 99 out of nine people, they pick the burn kid. And, and also you don't wanna work with the second kid because she's mean and she's obnoxious and she's loud and she has terrible body odor. Well, here's the scoop. I just described the same girl. In the first example, I only told you what happened to her. In the second example, I, to I, I only told you the symptoms of being abused. When I told you what happened to the kid, we all want to reach out to her. 
when I told you the symptoms, none of us want to work with it. To me, every kid is an A kid. There are no B kids. As it says in my first book, The Gus Chronicles, Reflections from an Abused Kid, where I made up a kid named Gus and had him write about what it's like to be abused, neglected, living in an out-of-home placement. And I made him smart so he could be reflective. What Gus writes is, the kid who's pushing away the most is always the one who needs you the most. Every time you have a client who's pushing your buttons, you should be thinking, what has happened in this kid's life? What's going on now to push me, push me away, now help the kid? Remember what I said before, behavior, no kid likes acting out, no adult does. They're sending you a message, help me out, give me the skills, give me the love, give me the inspiration, give me all that positive stuff, because I can change with your help. Um, the major reason you don't wanna work with a second kid it's like contaminating the kid with negative actions, rude, manipulative, lazy, it totally soured you. One of the hallmarks, and I mentioned this before, of being a great professional, is that you don't use words like obnoxious, rude, resistant, closed mouth, different, stubborn. Literally, what happens is if you call kids one of these words, they literally take it on and they stop trying. They develop what we call a fixed mindset. We talked about this. Everything is interrelated today. Please do not use these words. And also remember that these words come from a good place. Third one down, resistant. What did I say before? I don't think kids are resistant or adults. Usually they're cautious. You know, kids who are obnoxious. The first one, they're not really obnoxious. What they're doing is pushing you away. A kid who's been sexually abused, they'll say, when you do this and this and this, some people say you're choosing to be obnoxious. I think it's your way of pushing people away. That technique I'm using, it's one of the best in the strength-based world. Please use it. It's called reframing. So you take a negative behavior and you turn it positive. You find the protective value. My handouts and this PowerPoint are full of reframing examples. Please spend some time with it. I, my time is limited today. I had a kid come home from high school one day, very tough teenager, very rude, but he had enough strengths to make it at our public school. But he was a very rude kid. We didn't use the R word unless we put the word choose in front of it. He comes home one day and says, Charlie, I got to tell you something. I said, what? The secretary at Nashua High told me today, I'm the first kid in 30 years to get under her skin. I said, Jay, that's fantastic. Think about that. For 30 years, kids were booted out of class. They go down to the office. They provoke this little woman and you. You're the only one in 30 years to get under her skin. Wow. What an amazing, what an amazing ability you have to affect people. But the problem is this great talent of yours is getting you in trouble, hurting people's feelings, hurting uh, you know, pushing you away. We got to think of a way for you to use this skill that will help the world, help people. So we discussed it for a while. We figured out he'd be a great talk show host. People would either love him or hate him, but they'd have to tune him in. He walks away feeling great, knowing he has a skill, but he got to use it on the radio. It's not an accident that months later, I'm able to connect the fact that maybe his great ability to affect people had something to do with being so neglected as a kid. I don't have that talk with him if I put him down for being rude. Don't use these negative adjectives unless you were to put shoes in front of it. Look for the protective value. Decode all problem behavior and reframe it. Often there's an, I, I tell kids, you don't have a learning disability, you got a roadblock. You don't have bipolar, you don't have OCD, you got a roadblock. Every city in America has roadblocks where people get a, their, but people find their way to work because they find a way around it. That's all you got to do. Some of the greatest people in the world have your same roadblocks, learning disabilities, bipolar, Asperger's, OCD. They just find a way around it. You could change a kid's life when you reframe a behavior, give them a new way of looking. Oftentimes, it's three-step behavior. Understand behavior, reframe it into a positive, squeeze it somewhere, like do it on the radio. Kid swears, you're pretty expressive. You got words you never heard before. Do a one-on-one -on -one with me alone, not in front of anybody else, you know? As we finish today, a couple of really important things. What makes people happy? You know, obviously, we're talking about positivity all day today. When you're positive, that makes people happy. A guy named Acker, I, I quote him before, he says, when people are happier, they function better. And what makes people happy? Human connections, meaningful social connections. I would like you to spend five hours with this tool right here called the Echo Map. You take a client or a kid, put them in the middle, then rate their support networks from positive three to minus three. Positive three, this brings them a lot of support. Minus three, this seriously drain them. Anytime I'm working with a kid or a family, my number one job is to raise numbers. So for instance, you know, in terms of people getting along on the right, household responsibilities and routines. During a time of stress like now, it is critical for kids to have routines, families to have routines, homework at the same time, meals at the same time. Uh, you should have family meetings to set out what's the schedule for tomorrow. 
when you're living in a life of unpredictability, which is causing stress, you compensate by being more predictable. So now it's never been more important. So if you're working with a family who's loose around this stuff, get them to tighten up, have family meetings, put something on the wall, empower the kids. You can take that circle, because three is the best, minus three is where terribly, and, and, and raise a few points. In the middle is recreation. This is critical. People have been saying for years that when you have a challenging kid or adult, if they can have multiple successes throughout the day, they'll start behaving better. In the strength-based world, we have a nice saying, we focus on doing versus understanding. What's the message you send to kids if you say you need to be in therapy two or three times a week? I'm a hurting kid. I'd rather them be taking music lessons, sports, you know, a video class, whatever. I, I've been telling people like you for a million years now, the moment a tough kid wakes up in the morning, so the moment they go to bed, they should have multiple opportunities for success. That often means you're creating things for them to be successful, modifying, or creating new things. Uh, in your packet, and I don't have enough time, I'm finishing up, I list so many things that families in, can do every day to provide success opportunities for kids. And there's a great book, Helping Traumatized Kids Learn, written by a Boston outfit. They say categorically, when a traumatized kid feels good about himself in one area, it generalized to all other areas. I bring dice. I bring dice to every kid I work with. And oftentimes I'll say, okay, how many times can you roll the dice without getting doubles? And I let them roll like for five minutes. And maybe they, at one point they roll 12 in a row without getting doubles. I go, you are now the California state champion of the dice roll. I have literally seen kids come out of their shell because they were the dice champion. Every family can have dice, have a daily roll. You could do this online with kids. You know, uh, I've had kids tantruming. I rush up there, I see a kid tantruming, I go, hey, the record's 12, wanna go for it? In the middle of a tantrum, kid sits down, takes the dice, starts rolling. Why does that make a kid feel good? Does anybody can be successful at the dice roll? Anybody can be successful. I cannot stress to you enough, from the moment a kid wakes up in the morning to the moment he goes to bed, multiple opportunities. You create things, all this stuff. In your packet, I got tons of stuff. The top right is self-help. You know, you go online right now, there's some wonderful stuff to help you help your clients. Meditation, breathing techniques, mindfulness, body checks. What do they tell kids when they get anxious? There's a great thing called zones of regulation. It's referenced in my handout. It's a really great way of zones of regulation. What the experts say is when a kid starts getting anxious, have them check their body. Are they feeling tense, fidgety? Then thinking about the strategies you gave them. Um, so there's a lot of great stuff you could raise for your clients there. On the bottom, friends, relatives. You know, what makes people happy? Meaningful social connections. So really, really work with your clients to extend their connections. Reach out to friends, relatives who maybe they haven't connected with in a while. You know, bottom line, anytime I work with a family, a group, anything, all I'm thinking about is the echo map. You know, how can we raise numbers? How can we raise numbers? Because what makes people happy in this world is positive human connections. And last, I'm probably out of time. Oh, I got two minutes. So this is a great map. Go back to this. Study. Go online on the self-help stuff. It'll, it'll change a client's lives. And, if, uh, actually, and I heard on the bottom here, I heard, uh, I read online recently and have seen on TV a few times, experts touting that if you want people to make it through this pandemic, Give them the four M's. Moving, this is on the bottom here. Moving, mindfulness, mastery, and meaningful self-connections. Moving means get them outside, get them doing stuff. There's so much evidence to support that. When kids are outside, they literally function better. Uh, it's that vitamin A, whatever, to, you know, vitamin D, whatever. Mindfulness, we talked about being in the moment, changing the way they think. Mastery is all about the self-esteem stuff we talked about. Make sure kids have stuff every day that they're successful at. Um, if you're playing with kids, by the way, trouble kids, lose on purpose to them all the time. Don't let them know. I lose all the time to kids. They don't know. And I get really mad. Don't you tell anybody you beat me. They love it. And then meaningful social connections. And last, if you're working with families, um, what's really helpful to understand is that when you're working with a family, they're, they're wonderful people, but there's a process to working with families. First, you start with engagement. Get to know the family. Find out their strengths. Ask their advice. 
if the first thing you do with a family is criticize them or tell them they need to go to parent training or give them some advice, you started with the participation phase first. So really hooking families and everybody's a good person, you know, whether they're 60 or six or 30, hook them in, get to know them, find out what they do well, build a relationship with the family. And only at that point do you then start to do the work. Now, if I have a minute, I might go over time just a little, you could leave if you want. I want to show you my, the most important film clip in the history of the world. This clip stay, kept me in the business and will keep me in it forever. This is from the movie Stir Crazy with Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor. These two guys, they get locked in prison by mistake. Turns out Gene Wilder, that right there, has an amazing ability to ride rodeo bulls. So the warden wants him to ride in the annual rodeo against the local prison. He refuses. He says, I'm only going to ride if I could take my friends from the prison with me so we could secretly escape. So they start to torture Gene Wilder to ride in the rodeo. To make a long story short, I was feeling tortured at the time at my residential program. I was being asked to take too many kids, take on extra burdens, and I was really upset about it. But I, but I didn't know what to do, complain or say okay, because I knew I was getting this extra work because the director felt we were the best program, the best unit, and maybe I was one of the more talented guys there. So they're giving me extra work. So I didn't know whether to complain or let it go. Then, so I was kind of struggling. Complain, let it go. Then I saw Gene Wilder being tortured in these scenes and it changed my whole life. Um, watch Gene Wilder over the next minute or two. Be tortured to ride in the rodeo. Watch his reaction. And I'll comment why I think this is such an important video. Here we go. Sorry. What a mistake. I'm sorry. It never happened again. Yes, it's too late for that now. Come on. Close 10. Close 10. sense and again you just got to say to yourself when you have a hard job particularly during hard times one more day one more week and before you know it a month went by two months go by you've really helped people when they needed it the most and it doesn't get any better than that so thanks for doing what you do you guys are my heroes i'm sitting in a computer i'm sitting in a nice office here you're out there every day you're my heroes keep doing what you're doing i'm going to hang around for uh, questions uh you can certainly leave if you want i've kept you long let me see uh let's see right okay uh anybody out there do i need to put a microphone on anybody and i'll we stay do, answer questions charlie we do have we have five questions in the q a so you i read can, them out to me yes i can read those out so 
Well, we actually do. We have a few thank yous. So one person says- You're welcome, by the way, everybody. You're welcome in my honor. When do you stop giving kids incentives after you get them going? Well, that's a great question. You gotta ease them off it. You know, the reality is, by and large, when kids start to do better because of the incentives, uh, they don't really want them anymore. If they still require them, that could tell you that kid's at a different place. But all, a lot of times when you start using incentives with kids, you wanna be upfront at the beginning. Look, we're not gonna do this forever. All kids are like trains. You're a little stuck right now. That's why I love the train metaphor. So we're gonna do this for a couple of weeks, see how it goes. You know, just to get you moving forward. We're not gonna do this forever. So now, say the kid starts doing a little bit better, you subtly remind the kid, you know, along the way, hey, you know, in a couple of weeks, we're gonna ease off this, you know, because you don't need them anymore. You got the train off track. You're making it, man. So that's ideally how it works. Every kid is different. Some you might have to keep a little longer. Uh, but uh, that's how I, you know, again, be proactive about it. Tell them we're going to do this for a week or two to get you a little unstuck, get that train back on track. You know, you also can then extend it too. You can say instead of say a kid gets something every day, maybe after a week or two, if he's doing better, maybe he gets it every other day. So you can slowly extend that too. What's the rule of thumb with incentives? The more trouble a kid is or group, the more frequently you rate them, the more frequently you reinforce them, give them something. As they start to get better, stretch it out. So technically, as a kid starts to do better, you should be starting to stretch it out so that it's easing its way off anyways. Okay. So another question, if I'm only seeing a client short term, how can I help them heal? What's the most important thing? Well, I think the bottom line is what, you know, so, uh, a friend of mine's a psychotherapist. He's really good. He says, you know what the average amount of sessions the typical kid see goes for? One. And sometimes that changes the kid life. So look at some of the self-talk I gave you today. The harder I try, the higher I fly. Be the ego. If it's thinking, change the thinking. You could literally, in a very short time, give kids some cognitive behavioral words like that that they could keep the rest of their life. The weatherman, who I mentioned before, He's had 12 or 13 years of improved success getting along with his family because of one line that I heard me say on a TV show. So I think that also the way you frame short-term work, maybe you start with a client and says, you know, I love working with kids. I'm going to love working with you. Um, and we're only going to be together a couple of weeks and stuff, but I'll probably remember you the rest of my life and I'll feel very lucky that we work together, you know, so that, but, you just have to believe that even in one or two sessions, you can make a difference with the kid. I, I use the metaphor of the bricks. I think a lot of troubled kids don't have a good foundation, don't have the bricks that they should have got earlier. I believe every time you show up, every time you help a kid, you're putting some bricks in. If you're short term, maybe you're putting a little less than a long term, but those bricks are going in. That's what I'd say there. Be upfront about it. We're only gonna work three times together, but we're gonna have three great sessions and I'm gonna remember you the rest of my life and you are gonna make it, something like that. Next question. All right, so we have two more questions. Uh, All right. The next one, how do you refuel yourself to have the energy to work with others in a positive manner? What do you do now to refuel and how has that changed compared to when you first started working with youth with challenges? Great, great question. I do a whole training on just managing yourself. By the way, I saw someone ask a question about the PowerPoint and the handout. You folks are going to be sending both within a day or two. I have to go back and clean up my PowerPoint because if you notice on the bottom right of all my slides, I have a little word or two to tell me what the next word, the next slide is. Because I'm old, I can't remember. So I got to get rid of those little words. So you will be able to get both my PowerPoint and a really big handout within a day or so by CPA here. And there's no copyright. Use it any way you can. So the question just now was, how do you take care of yourself? I'm going to do a two-hour training in three minutes here. Two things first. We are the most important people in any interaction we have with, with the kids. And we don't always do that well. I think there are two major reasons why we act out towards kids. One, you take it personally. Your self-esteem takes a hit. Self-esteem is fragile in all of us. Anytime you take a hit to your self-esteem, you gotta say to yourself, it's an injury and it will heal. Respond instead of react. Five minutes later, 10 minutes from now, I won't remember this. Two days ago, I won't remember this. It's an injury, it will heal respond instead of react. Having that self-management ability 
can literally save your life in this business because when you work with at-risk clients, you're going to suffer multiple hits to your self-esteem every day. And you have to be able to say to yourself, oh, it's an injury, it will heal. An hour from now, two days from now, it's gone. And respond instead of react means use the golden rule. Don't say or do anything to a client you wouldn't want said or done to yourself. Then the other huge reason we act out towards our clients is lack of support. Someone once wrote that lack of support causes people to be punitive. And none of us who work with kids get the right amount of support. So in my packet, I have like five strategies to think about when you're in the heat of action that help you respond instead of react when you're burned out, when you're not getting enough support, breaks, training, praise. One, just think about it. I'm tired, I'm worn out, I haven't had a break in two weeks. Uh, I feel like yelling, I feel like, stop it. I can do anything for two more hours. I can do anything for one more day. I can't tell you how many people email me and say, Charlie, that's my number one technique. I think I can do anything for one more hour. And at that point, I also ask people to use the audacity word. You, Charlie, you have the audacity to compare your life to these people. You got it so much better than they do. You can do anything for two more hours. You can do anything for two more hours. So I look at my handout. I have these like wonderful five strategies to help you respond instead of react when you wear down. And then the other thing I do to recharge is really I use the echo map. You know, I put myself in the middle and I'm constantly in my head doing the echo map. You know, if, when I first presented the echo map at a training 20 years ago, there's a bubble that says family. And I hadn't seen the Appelstein side of the family in like 15 years. And I have tons of cousins. We were really tight when I was a kid. We lost track. I said, what a hypocrite you are. I went home and I got on the internet. I found all the Appelsteins. We had a big reunion. People are kissing, hugging. 15 years later, we're stronger as a family than we were as a kid because people missed what we had. You know, my life is so much better now because I brought my family together. I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't brought my family together because my first cousin's kid, Adam, is, a, is an audio engineer. He called me three weeks ago and says, you need to do webinars. He said, I don't like doing them. I need the rec. He says, you got to do them. I'm here today because of my family. So you want to get in the middle, look at recreation. What are you doing to take care of yourself? Uh, a couple of years ago, I was really feeling kind of lousy. I said, I got to find a sport I can do. I started playing tennis. Now I play three or four times a week when we used to do it. I met friends. I look forward to it. It gets me through the stress. You know, say you're a woman out there and uh, you're married to a traditional lunkhead and you have to do all the cooking and cleaning in your house. Kick them in the butt and start sharing the responsibilities. You know, self-help, we talked about that. Pick up some mindfulness. Bottom line, to recharge yourself, you want to add numbers to your echo map. There isn't anybody out there today that can't look at that echo map and can't add five points within a month. And every point you raise in your echo map, which is an extra level of support, you know, look for friends right now. What are people doing now? They're looking for friends. I'm talking to friends I haven't talked to in 20 years. It's making me feel better. Religion is one of the bubbles. You know, go online with that now or what is best, you know, what a great source of support for people. Religion, animals, you know, maybe time to get a dog. Bottom line, look at the bubbles. Look at how you can support yourself. Every number you can raise on your echo map increases the odds you're a better person. And again, you talked about recharging. What keeps me going again is the bricks. You know, I don't judge my success when I work with people based on their behavior. It's my behavior. And every time I did a good job with someone, I feel I put some bricks in. That just makes me feel good. And I get calls from kids I worked with 30 years ago, and they thank me profusely for what me and my staff did. And it feels so wonderful. And every time I hang up the phone, I look at my wife, and I go, I guess we put a few more bricks in than I thought. Bricks in than I thought. Bricklaying is a hard job when it's hot and humid. It's a hard job when it's freezing cold. But how does the bricklayer feel three months later when there's a beautiful house sitting on the foundation he or she ached over, grunted over? Don't you think the bricklayer drives by with his or her family and says, see that beautiful house? Wouldn't be there if it wasn't for me. And you don't remember how much it hurt, how much it ached, all the tension you went through. All you know is something beautiful is standing because you have the guts to show up every day. That recharges me every day. I value every little thing I do with a client. I know it's a brick. All right, that was a little long-witted response to that one. Any more questions? So it looks like the last question is just about the PowerPoints and the handout. And yes. some people are asking for the link to the video that you showed. 
So. Oh, that's a great question. That's a really good one. Um, I will send that. I can find that link. Okay. And uh, I think if, if, until I do, if you go on YouTube and put the kid who talked too much or something like that, I think it'll come up. But I'll send the link. Yeah, you, you want to see that video. It's amazing. I see it. Incredible. I cried just thinking about it. So the handouts and, and, um, and this PowerPoint will be sent to you guys and can be easily distributed and I will send the link. Uh, I might be able to sync the link on Stir Crazy. That's the movie Stir Crazy. I'm not sure I can, but I might try because I didn't get that from the internet. So, okay. Okay, and that was the last question. Just a bunch of, a lot of thank you messages. And my, it was my pleasure. I'm honored to be here. Thank you to CPA for inviting me to do these two. And uh, also for the people out there today, we had a really nice session last week for parents. It was recorded. Feel free to show the parents. There's some stuff in there that wasn't in today's. So it's just more tools for the toolbox. That's all. More tools for the toolbox. Positive strength-based tools. Thank you, everybody. All right. Appreciate the nice feedback. Thank you, Charlie.